Right, I think we'll get started here. Um, if folks come in, they'll, they'll just come in. Um, but uh, I'm very, very pleased to welcome everybody to our uh, Max Cotta Institute virtual lecture series for this month. And um, our guest uh, today is Dr. Benjamin Bryce. Um, ben is an assistant professor in the Department of History at the University of British Columbia. Um, I just found out he's a native of the Yukon. It's the first time I've made it, met a native Yukoner before. Um, he received his uh, uh, graduate education uh, at York University in Ontario, finishing his PhD there in 2013. Um, he's the author of a book called The Boundaries of Ethnicity, German Immigration and the Language of Belonging in Ontario, which is uh, forthcoming in the fall with McGill Queens University Press. He's also the author of another monograph, To Belong in Buenos Aires, Germans, Argentines, and the Rise of a Pluralist Society, which appeared in 2018 with Stanford University Press. He's also the co-editor of three volumes, most recently, Race and Transnationalism in the Americas, which appeared um, just this past year with the University of Pittsburgh Press. So with that, I will turn things over and welcome Dr. Bryce for his presentation today, which is titled, Making English Canada, German and French Bilingual Schools in Ontario, 1880 to 1912. Thank you, Ben. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for that uh, introduction. Oh, I've already made a mistake on my PowerPoint. I was going to make sure that you could see a PowerPoint screen in my uh, and hear me fairly well. Uh, I'll get Mark to chime in if that's not the case. Um, so, uh, just a, my Mark mentioned that my talk will be. 40 45 minutes things will have gone horribly off the rails if i'm still speaking after 45 minutes um but uh, uh in any case uh um i'd just like to thank everyone for coming for joining us today i can i can see who's a participant as a, a presenter in the webinar and so uh reinhardt i noticed you thank nice to see a, a south american connection there uh hello everyone and welcome uh, to this talk uh i'd really like to thank uh the max Cotta institute the university of wisconsin uh, and then both Mark Loud and, and Antia Petty for uh, making this uh, talk possible. I'd also like to begin by acknowledging that I join you today from the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people on what is now the campus of what is now the campus of UBC in Vancouver. Uh, the title of my talk is Making English Canada, German and French Bilingual Schools in Ontario, uh, 1880 to 1912. It's a story that'll sound familiar to those of you who have, who have read or researched about language politics and the history of education as it pertained to German Americans in, in various states uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century. To those unfamiliar with these kinds of histories, and also I would, the, the case of Canada or Ontario, uh, one thing that my talk today on a sort of simple level highlights uh, is everything I'm describing is taking place before the First World War. I'm talking about Anglophone nationalism, uh, repression to some extent of the repression of the German language, and this is all happening in the 1880s and 1890s. Uh, something very similar played out across the United States in the same time period and for factors similar to those ones I'm describing here. Uh, as Paul Ramsey notes, that bilingual schooling in the U.S. Midwest that began in the 1840s as public education was first taking off uh, and lasted until the 1880s when the progressive era brought, and I quote, brought forth a new tone to American society in which the centralization of schools, particularly in urban areas, challenged the localism that allowed bilingualism to flourish in America's public institutions. And the same can be said uh, very much in the case of Ontario. So there's an earlier rise of a public system which is allowing local variation and then there's a process of standardization that emerges in the 1880s. Uh, Frederick Lupka uh, notes similarly, speaking about the US Midwest, that between the 1870s and 1890s, legislators in many states began to craft legislation that ensured that English was the sole language of instruction while allowing other language to, languages to continue as subjects. And again, that distinction between language of instruction and subject of instruction is a really important difference that uh, in an older generation of uh, historiography and sort of public understanding are glossed over as one and the same. So the end of, a, of German as a subject of instruction in 1917 is not the same as German as a language of instruction in 1885. So I'm going to show a similar story that plays out in Ontario, but I want to add some nuance to how that happened, focusing on very specific things like textbook regulation, uh, standardization of textbook policies, the centralization of state authority, and sort of how that's actually implemented, the, the rise of central authority over local variation. And I suspect that further research into various American states would reveal similar stories, but those similar stories are also not actually 
uh, fully developed and how the mechanisms of state power is, are being enforced over local communities. So starting in the 1880s, in the case of Ontario, as education becomes a more universal experience, there's a transformation of a previous multilingual system. It wasn't through specific legislation banning the German language or any explicit attack, any sort of uh, clear moment of uh, xenophobia or nativism, but rather a series of standardizing policies focused on textbooks, high school entrance exams, teacher training, and a broader interest in, in, in fostering the English language. So in the case of Ontario, German was one of, one of only three possible languages of instruction from the foundation of the public school system in the 1850s and until 1912, when the province, taking in particularly at, at French schools, uh, attempted to make uh, an entirely unilingual system in which English was the only possible language of instruction. So German has a very special place and a very special place along two, two other languages that in the case of uh, Canada, French and English, have these uh, clear constitutional and different status. And it's through this process of sort of slowly pushing out German, uh, take, removing this previous uh, charmed place that the German language had in the 1850s, uh, you can see that education bureaucrats and elected politicians are, are seeking to merge the cultural and political definitions of belonging. And they're pushing the idea that all citizens should share a common language, an idea that in the 1850s, whether it's in Canada, the United States or elsewhere, was not dominant. So it's sort of a, a new idea emerging about the, the importance or the value or the desire to create a, a, a monolingual society. To, the, to scholars of this time period, people are familiar with this story, the story I'm telling, if it sounds like uh, what you might have also encountered in Wisconsin in the 1880s, uh, my, my sense is that the Canadian part of the story is nonetheless different and hopefully can add some interesting points of reflection. So as a point of departure, it's a bilingual country then and now. Uh, and it's a bilingual country taking aim or trying to sort of stamp out a certain version of bilingualism. So there's various, or there's a, a duality of bilingualism existing here in which English French has got certain relationships in Ontario. And then there's bilingualism of German speakers uh, uh, through this public fund, this, this public system. And so in a sense though, at the end of this period and the end of my paper today, you're gonna see both English speakers and French speakers in Ontario behaving in ways very similar to American nativists but while maintaining uh, an interest in bilingualism. So it's not pushing uh, uh, an American language or a, a monolingualism, it's, it's allowing a place for bilingualism, but only amongst two languages, not any other possible languages. The title of my talk today, uh, Making English Canada, is maybe worth refer or explaining what I mean by making English Canada. Uh, in the first about 75 years of, of Canadian history, the creation of Canada as a modern, more or less uh, independent country uh, within the British Empire starting in 1867, the geographies of English Canada and French Canada overlap. So English Canada is not the thing that exists outside of Quebec, but rather French Canada and English Canada in this early period are sort of sharing the same space or competing for the same space. And there's these competing visions of what Canada will become uh, in the coming decades. So as the Canadian state expanded westward into places like Manitoba and Saskatchewan, straight north of Wisconsin, uh, the northwest of Wisconsin, uh, the balance of power between English and French was not yet clear. And so there's this, the, the efforts to make English Canada was an explicit project uh, and something that was being made. And alongside that, those efforts to make an English Canada and sort of maybe limit French Canada to, to places east of Ontario uh, uh, is something that actually involves other linguistic groups such as uh, Germans in the case of Ontario and then other groups like Ukrainians, Germans and Poles in the Canadian prairies. So to, from a more Canadian perspective, uh, to the historiography and national memory about the struggles between English and French and ideas about language and belonging, I want to add that other linguistic groups mattered. So in the case of Ontario, Canada's largest prof province, there's clearly a, a, a missing knowledge of the role or the place of German in which there are three languages being talked about in this early school legislation and early discussions of bilingualism. Uh, it's only three in that there's a, this third language has been largely overlooked in understanding how Anglophones and Francophones are interacting. So indeed, when Anglophones and Francophones debated bilingual education in the province from the 1880s up until the, the eve of the First World War, they often spoke of German schools. I'm gonna give you some, several examples of how they're explicitly referencing German schools, or when they're talking about German schools, they're explicitly referencing French schools. So later, the space that French speakers carved out for themselves in a dialogue with Anglophone nationalism 
is coming at the expense of other languages. A quick note on terms, I was I thought maybe it'd be easier just to delete it from all references, but it's sort of it's it permeates all the sources. I'm going to use this term separate schools or Catholic separate schools uh, several times today. So in Ontario, this is referring to religious schools, usually Catholic, but not necessarily. So separate schools could also be Protestant schools. They were publicly funded and controlled. So there's both a public system and a separate school system, but both public and separate schools are public schools. Uh, and there are no private or non-state elementary schools. Um, as is the case of in, in studies of uh, German and other foreign language education in the United States. So before going any further, uh, I want to add an important bit of context that is far too often left our discussions of European immigration to North America. I'm zooming in here on the case of Ontario, but it's hopefully some food for thought about broader stories of also the American Midwest. So this is a story of how a privileged group of European immigrants and their descendants carved out a, a space for cultural linguistic plural, pluralism in Canadian society, and then how some of those privileges were later rolled back. It coincided with the displacement of Indigenous peoples, not only from access to land and resources, but also to the generational transmission of language and culture. The Ontario government is creating locally controlled schools, teaching in one of three European languages between the 1850s and the 1880s, at the exact same time that the Ontario government or the federal government as it existed in Ontario is laying the groundwork for Indian day schools and residential schools, which had an explicit goal of breaking the generational transmission of language. So these are sort of parallel stories and the story of European immigrants succeeding or, or fostering a certain kind of European pluralism is coexisting with this broader process uh, of an eliminationist uh, settler colonialism. In the case of settlement in particular and the spread or places where Germans dwelled uh, in, uh, in southern Ontario, this coincides with sort of the, the very beginning of European settlement uh, in the province. So starting in the 1780s and 1790s, German speakers alongside uh, people of British and other backgrounds were among the first to migrate to Ontario, particularly from the United States in places like New York and Pennsylvania. In the case of Germans, they came to the Niagara Peninsula, that's the, the circle on the bottom by Niagara Falls. And, and also to the area uh, east of Kingston, so on the border of Quebec, if you can see, depending on how your camera, the, if my face is blocking the eastern part of my map. These early German migrations were deeply enmeshed with the rising land dispossession of Indigenous peoples in southern Ontario, the Grand River settlements in what became Waterloo County, so I'm zooming in now on this blue circle on the map, uh, and Waterloo County is in the bottom right of that map. These early settlements were built on Block 2, which had been acquired from the Haudenosaunee Six Nations, uh, a decade before, Haudenosaunee Six Nations, another also known as the Iroquois or Iroquois. Um, this was the beginning of a process of reducing the size of reserve lands and then also the annuities paid by the government to Indigenous peoples. And especially after about 1815, an explicit policy of the colonial government in, in Southern Ontario was to systematically take control uh, of almost all land in Southern Ontario and then dole it out to new white settlers. So the more German immigration, the more British immigration that's coming to Ontario is part and parcel of the system of also dispossessing uh, Indigenous peoples of access and ownership. And so in these in this early decades of Ontario history, uh, in the seven treaties signed between 1815 and, 19, or 1815 and 1827, the Crown is uh, increasingly securing access for non-Native peoples to then settle and fill up the province with new European bodies. This, the way in which German speaking settlers alongside people of other backgrounds is a telling example of how non dominant immigrant, immigrant groups play a crucial role in settler colonialism. Further German immigration in the 1820s and 1830s into Western Ontario drew settlers onto the acquired Huron Tract, Crown Treaty 29. So that's uh, in the southwest of that blue circle I've drawn on that map. Uh, and this led to further German speaking communities in places like Perth and Huron counties in the 1820s and 30s. And this is a, a process that's repeated over and over again in the 1850s and 1860s. There's new significant German speaking settlements in places like Bruin, Bruce and Gray counties in the northern part of that blue circle. Uh, and it carries on into Northern Ontario and then into the Canadian West in places like Manitoba and Saskatchewan, where German speakers are joining Anglophones and Francophones as settlers on the frontiers of an expanding Ontario and Canada. <clears throat> 
One final bit of just a broader context about this story of Germans in Ontario. You can see this demographic data taken from the Canadian, various Canadian censuses between 1881 and 1831, 1931, 1881 to 1931. Uh, you can see the German speakers start off this period as about 10% of the population of Ontario is a very significant uh, uh, ethno-linguistic minority. Uh, another thing that might be worth flagging if you look at the the years between 1901 and 1911, it's only then around, say, about 1905 that, that Frank, French speakers become a bigger uh, linguistic group than German speakers, as uh, according to uh, these official uh, census records. Um, and so it's uh, a, a clear ang English speaking and sort of British heritage uh, province with these two significant ethno linguistic groups. And it's only starting around the First World War and into the 1920s that there's a diversification of different ethnic groups. You can see in the final column, um, uh, rising to about 15% um, of the province's population by 1931, people who are not of British, French, or German background. So to my main focus, uh, uh, I've had a couple segues here. I wanna talk mainly about the, the nature of state power and the nature of uh, making bilingual schools and slowly pushing English language through Ontario schools. Uh, my paper today discusses the efforts to make the Ontario school system monolingual. So it starts as a point as a point of departure looking at French and German schools, but it looks at the efforts to actually try to as a government efforts to try to make those French and German schools uh, English schools or uh, as English as possible. So then it, and it argues that the dialogue with both French and German speakers is uh, is forming are playing influence in shaping English speakers' ideas about both national and civic belonging. This negotiation in turn gave form to the nature of cultural pluralism in the province and became a foundation from which later um, multiculturalism and government attempts to manage that diversity emerged in Canada. The growing linguistic ideology in this time period was dominated by what Yasmin Yildiz calls the monolingual paradigm. She contends that starting only in the 19th century, and this is an increasingly dominant idea over the course of the 19th century in both uh, Europe and North America, and also in places like Argentina, monolingualism became uh, seen as, and I quote, a key structuring principle that organizes the entire range of modern social life from the construction of individuals and their subjectivities uh, to the formation of disciplines and institutions, as well as imagined collectives such as cultures and nations. In promoting compulsory education after the School Act of 1871, bureaucrats and politicians in Ontario articulated a linguistic ideology, which they're increasingly undoing a previous understanding of allowing place for German, French, and English, and instead uh, increasingly pushing this monolingual paradigm. So universal and compulsory attendance was accompanied by a project of universal literacy, which soon evolved into a focus, a focus on English literacy. So one thing also maybe is worth noting that this uh, push to sort of eliminate languages like German as a language of instruction, you could apply that further to other parts of, uh, of English-speaking North America, so including the United States, where other languages are targeted. It's coinciding with the moment of compulsory education, so in the 1850s is not compulsory education, uh, and in the 1880s there's is also this greater push to, to foster universal literacy. So these all these ideas are taking place at the same time, and it's worth noting then that the push for English or the attack on other languages um, is coming at a very specific moment of education, philosophies, and, and state power, and the, 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 the growth of state power. In the, starting in the 1880s, the Ontario Education Department, so this is the, what in, later in Ontario becomes the ministry, so the central uh, state bureaucracy, the Education Department, it began to require specific textbooks uh, to increase the number of certified te teachers. In a previous moment, uh, the, to become a teacher would require far less state supervision, state uh, certification. Uh, and in general, uh, the, the goal of the 1880s Education Department was to ensure that all children attending Ontario's public and separate schools learned English, even if it was alongside French or German. So the most salient feature of language policies in Ontario in the 1880s was not a conflict between linguistic groups, but rather a firm fixation on English grammar, composition, spelling, and pronunciation. Those four things, grammar, composition, spelling, and pronunciation, were all separate subjects that together formed the, the cornerstone of the curriculum of the public and separate school system. So to just give you one example of how important language, language arts was in the educational experience, the elementary school uh, experience for children in late 19th century Ontario. In 1900, English composition, literature, grammar, and writing were four of the nine subjects being tested on high school entrance exams. So 
you test math, you test things like science, and then you test four different kinds of English. So there's like a, a very strong focus on pushing the English language or, or using or thinking of elementary school as something as fostering literacy and uh, English sort of a, a mastery of the English language, whether they are the children of Anglophones or the children of other linguistic groups. So these multiple language classes made English one of the defining experiences of Ontario, the Ontario school system, even at what both the government and people continued to call French and German schools. So it's through this focus on English uh, that the French and German schools of the 1870s and of the 1850s became bilingual schools by the turn of the 20th century. Even if the label, the official name remained the same, there's this clear new English focus at French and German schools in the, by, by 1900. The education department and local school boards had jurisdiction over separate domains within a single state apparatus, and it's the diff different domains and the, the central authority of an education department in Toronto that's playing a really important role in changing this balance between English and other languages. So the school boards in charge, uh, the local school boards in charge of things like administrative matters, infrastructure, or hiring teachers who had been trained by the province, but the, the education department, the, the central provincial authority, uh, is the one fostering English uh, and therefore, uh, through things like the certification or selecting textbooks, which I'll get into in a second. The status that French and German or German and French had enjoyed as alternative languages of instruction in Ontario changed fundamentally in 1885. In that year, the government, the government made English compulsory in every school where it was not already the language of instruction. And one way that it, was, it, it sort of pushed the standardization and spreading English in French and German schools uh, was authorizing a single series of textbook readers called the public school readers. Um, and they required that every school teach English writing, spelling, composition, and translation into English. So there's a slight variation of the four kinds of language training that are taking place at these French and German schools. And so it's instead of um, pronunciation, it's instead of a focus on translation into English. So these four separate English subjects are advancing a linguistic ideology in schools where French and German remain the language of instruction. In a speech defending provincial policy towards French schooling, and there's often sort of bouncing off one another when they're talking about French schools or talking about German schools, George Ross, the Minister of Education, later Premier of the province, lauded this 1885 policy change as a really significant uh, sort of bureaucratic shift in how, the school, how schools are, are conceived in the province. Uh, and he emphasized this marked an improvement over the previous lack uh, of obligatory English language instruction in these French and German settlements. In 1889, he asserted, and I quote, the right to a good thorough English education is recognized by the constitution of the province of Ontario as a birthright of every citizen, irrespective of creed, and as I understand public sentiment. No government could long exist that ignored much less, much less repudiated this right. In 1890, the imposition of English in what remained French and German schools solidified. Throughout this period, the province did not change the legislation that stated that the language of instruction could be French or German, or that French and German could be used as alternatives in instruction. Uh, and then there was this referring, recurring term from, uh, from, the, from 1851 up until the First World War uh, in, school sec in school sections where the French or German language prevailed. So in these places that are German speaking or French speaking, uh, local variation can take place. So there's not a uh, there's not a revision of that legislation that gives these special rights for this sort of trilingual system. But in 1890, two new regulations modified the law. One stipulated that the English abilities of children attending German or French schools should be the same as the language skills of children at English schools. And the second authorized French and German to be taught in addition to English instead of the 1885 regulation that added English to the curriculum of German and French schools. These are incremental policy changes that are subtly and slowly, or not so slowly, but definitely subtly undoing the previous trilingual system. And through these changes, through these incremental changes, the province is taking an important step in articulating and implementing a linguistic ideology uh, that pushes the idea that all citizens of a given territory, in this case, Ontario, should, care, uh, should share a common language, in this case, English. So local school boards could push back by failing to hire teachers capable of teaching English in addition to French or German. But this push for English is still revealing sort of the general trend of what the province is trying to do. And by the turn of the 20th century, the, the province is largely successful. Uh, it's, it's largely successful in making English necessary in, in German or French supplementary. 
These policies are also marking a really important rupture in uh, mid 19th century thinking that are allowing the use of state resources through local taxation uh, to support a multilingual society. Textbooks, so alongside these sort of policies about making sure that schools teach English or that schools can teach German in addition to English, textbook regulation and selection becomes another important concern of education bureaucrats in an important way that central state authority in Toronto is uh, shaping local variation or in, in, in lim limiting or minimizing local variation as it existed a generation before. So between 1882 and 1892, the number of authorized textbook series that existed in the province of Ontario decreased from 53 to 10. So there's a, 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 a rapid standardization of textbooks in the 1880s that's coinciding with these other things about pushing the English language. Authorities in the provincial capital rather than local school boards were the ones that controlled textbook selection and in so doing they're asserting their authority over local language preference. In the case of German language education in particular, this act of standardization is significantly limiting the materials that teachers and school boards could use to teach the language. As part of an 1889 report on French and German schools, again, there's a constant studying of both of these kinds of linguistic groups together, the commissioners Reynard, McLeod, and Tilly reported that seven, seven different German textbooks or series were being used in Ontario public schools. So they're finding in 1889, there's a great variety of, of, of German ed, uh, textbook materials being used in these German speaking settlements of the province. The commissioners noted that these textbooks, and I quote, though not authorized, have been introduced by the trustees or teachers as the most suitable they could find. So again, as a clear example in 1889 of local variation, making use of the context, in, many, in all these cases are uh, importing almost all their textbooks from uh, German speaking centers in the United States. And they're also notice, uh, noting in their same study about local variation and the ongoing use uh, of uh, a diverse range of textbook materials, that the English readers that had been prescribed by the province in 1885 were found in all the schools they visited. So there's evidence here of both local variation and success of the province in, in implementing uh, its push for English alongside the, the uh, continuation of German. And as a result of their study of this local variation that existed as they found in 1889, the commissioners recommended that a single series of German readers be authorized and that all others be discontinued. So a year later in 1890, the education department asserts its authority over local school boards and began to follow its recommendation, authorizing a single textbook. And I'm gonna talk about, there's four, there's four readers, sort of four levels for the seven years of elementary education. Um, and I'm gonna talk about a couple, or you can see some pictures already of the readers on the screen. Uh, the clerk for the, of the executive council, John Cartwright wrote that the minister had ordered, and I quote, that where the German language prevails and the trustees with the approval of the inspector, require German to be taught in addition to English, a single series entitled Anne's German Books and German Readers should be used. You can see here a table of contents from one of these, uh, one of these books. Some things are, uh, so one thing that's, that's immediately obvious in these, in these prescribed German textbooks um, to be used at these um, schools where German had been the language of instruction is these textbooks are bilingual. They're using the English language to teach the German language or to teach German grammar. Individual school boards did not appear to be rejecting the, this prescribed German textbook of the 1890s, although several historians have found that in the case of Francophones, there is in fact local rejection and sort of ongoing resistance to these standardizing policies. But if thinking of that comparative alter, uh, uh, situation in which there is evidence of resistance, there doesn't seem to be similar resistance um, in places where the German language prevailed. For any German speaking parent, educator, or community leader dreaming of a bilingual school system in specific localities of Ontario, the provincially prescribed textbooks after 1890 represented a pedagogical nightmare. Anne's German readers were clearly intended for the children of Anglophones and would have been a disservice to any child who spoke German at home. The readers explained everything in English, and it seems that such grammars would have contributed to cementing English as a dominant written language for children from German speaking households with questionable benefits for, for promoting bilingualism. The reader for the first class began by teaching German handwriting as well as German sounds by comparing them to English ones. For example, according to the book, you can learn that the short German I uh, is pronounced like the I in the English word bit, and then the long German I is like the EE in the English word meat. So sort of explaining 
uh, English or German phonemes in comparison to English, which is assumed to be the dominant, um, the dominant language of children. The, the book also explains things like the CH sound does not exist in English and that it needed to be learned from the teacher, suggesting that the target pupils of this textbook, not to say that the pupils actually who were using them were this way, but the way the provinces, the materials being authorized to teach these pupils, um, it, it suggests that the pupils were not already orally proficient in German. The, the most advanced fourth book sought to give the pupil, and I quote, a fair mastery of German in speaking and in writing, which again suggests the intention of the book, not, not the actual reality of the children, but the intention of the book um, was that the children uh, would not be coming from German speaking homes. This fourth readers, the final, the highest level, um, introduced pupils to a more advanced, to more advanced aspects of the German language compared to the previous three books, but the level still remained relatively basic. It taught the use of auxiliary verbs, prepositions governing the dative and genitive cases, conjugations of strong and weak verbs, and it included conversational exercises and a vocabulary that translated German words into English. In addition to this textbook that becomes the, the only prescribed or the, the main suggested prescri uh, prescribed textbook in the province after 1890 in the face of previous, a previous system of local variation, the province continued to authorize what the province called Klotz's German grammar. The book had been widely used for two decades in many schools in the absence of state regulation. And unlike the authorized German readers, which the province was pushing and increasingly uh, embraces the, as the sole uh, uh, option, Klotz's grammar was clearly, clearly intended for native speakers and would have made a helpful companion in the promotion of written proficiency in German among children who arrived at school already capable of speaking the language. In 1898, however, so eight years after this sort of main step of getting rid of all the local variation and, and, and authorizing a single textbook with the exception of allowing the persistence of this one local produced textbook. In 1898, however, provincial bureaucrats removed Klotz's textbook, textbook from the authorized list. So Otto Klotz published Leitfaden zur deutschen Sprache oder kurz gefasstes Lehrbuch der deutschen Sprache in Fragen und Antworten in 1867 in Preston, Ontario. He was a school superintendent in that town and a member of the Waterloo County School Board. So he's a a local education official fostering the German language. He's a German speaking immigrant uh, and playing a role at the local level in educational politics. His grammar resembled a classical grammar written in German speaking Europe, although he noted in his introduction that those grammars were too philosophical and that the, the local youth could not understand them sufficiently. He added in German, and I'll quote here in English, the lack of a textbook to teach the German language has been mentioned so often and felt even more so by everybody who has been involved with teaching German that it would be completely redundant to justify the need for such a textbook. His reasons for writing the grammar were, and I quote, teachers using English with few exceptions also teach English grammar. However, teaching a, a teacher using German usually, usually limits himself entirely to reading and writing. Therefore, his knowledge of grammar remains almost completely unused. Finally, he noted, and I quote, certainly the book will be helpful if German parents express their desire that their children learn the mother tongue along, alongside English so they do not just speak German, but also can read it and write it. So Klaus's grammar contained no text and was exclusively in German. He discussed several linguistic and grammatical issues such as sounds, spelling, pronouns, verbs, conjunctions, and sentence structure. And it was clearly to be used in schools with German speaking teachers and pupils, and it was not intended to teach German as a second language. Yet after its elimination from the provincial curriculum, which still in, in writing allowed uh, the use of German as a language of instruction, the only textbooks that local school boards in Ontario could use were designed for Anglophones. German could be the language of instruction according to legislation created in 1871 and based on a previous body of legislation from 1851, but the authorized textbooks along with the imposition of English alongside German in 1885 and 1890 and the financial penalties for not for failing to follow these requirements, ensure that German could not be taught in a meaningful way to the children of native speakers. As a result, the textbooks used in the elective and infrequent German language classes, which continued on as subjects of instruction, were of utmost importance. Yet all of these books taught German grammar in English, and they explained German sounds with the assumption that the student had a better mastery of English phonemes. <clears throat> 
bilingual education became a major political crisis in Ontario starting in 1912. There's several moments in early Canadian history as sort of the boundaries of English Canada, French Canada got meted out at the, at the provincial level. Uh, the federal government often intervened. There's strong uh, uh, pressure applied from, from elites in Quebec who at the same time were recognizing the rights of Anglophone minorities in Quebec. Uh, in the case of Ontario, it came to a head in 1912, and it lasted for uh, 15 years. And basically, the, along the short of it, it's called Regulation 17, which is sort of a key moment in Franco-Ontarian history. The government of Ontario effectively tried to ban the use of the French language um, in, in, the, in the school system, which for the previous 60 years had allowed space for French language instruction. The vestiges of 19th century language policy remained, and German became a topic in the debate, in this debate of, of a sort of national significance uh, amongst Anglophones and Francophones alike. For the Conservative government, German speakers were often talked about as an enviable model that Francophones should have emulated. They should have slowly accepted the imposition of English over the previous generation, and then by 1912 not had an issue with the pro with, with the sort of greater imposition of English. There, Germans were often used as a counterexample of so the outcome of a bilingual system which should lead to a monolingual system. French speakers were also very aware of the official status that German enjoyed in provincial regulations regarding the language of instruction as well. And they kept on in re repeatedly, and I'm going to give you some examples of in particular how French speakers spoke about German speakers in this 1912 moment. Um, and but in doing so, sort of began to separate themselves from this previous uh, triad of English, French, German. Instead, assert different rights for Fran uh, francophones than for German speakers. In particular, they use this term of natural rights and sort of the judi uh, juri uh, judicial concept of the 19th century. And these natural rights of French speakers as Can one of Canada's two founding peoples. And again, also then advancing this idea of these two founding peoples with special rights compared to all other linguistic minorities. So Francophones brought up Germans as a way to explain the special rights that others did not have. In 1914, Canadian Senator Napoleon Antoine Belcourt represented the Board of Trustees of the Roman Catholic Separate Schools of Ottawa before the Supreme Court of Ontario. He argued that the province recognized parents, and I quote, right to demand that the French or German language be the language of instruction and communication in the schools attended by their children. The new government legislation, in his view, and I quote, violates natural law and natural justice because it seeks to take away the right to have one's money applied to one's own purposes. That is a right similar to other rights of property, the taking away of which constitutes a violation of natural law. He argued, and I quote, the right to speak one's mother tongue is a natural right which every human being has. The enactment of Regulation 17 constitutes the only attempt ever made in the British Empire to, to, to deprive British subjects of the use of their mother tongue. A, a clear overstatement. Uh, I think you could say that this is, is, hap this is what's happening to, to most immigrants in Canada in this time period, uh, including German speakers. This is also what's happening to Indigenous people in very concerted efforts, whether in 1912 or in 1885, uh, across Canada, who were in fact also British subjects with limited rights uh, and a sort of concerted policy since the 1850s. So, but there's the sort of uh, creating this idea that, that there's this uh, extreme mistreatment of Francophones uh, and in ways that is sort of unjustified and compared to other groups. C. de la Legalité claims, and I quote, we are being submitted to the same treatment of this matter as are the Maoris of New Zealand, the native population corresponding to our Indians, with the ex exception of the miserable pittance that we have to beg for each year. Uh, de la Legalité was oddly concerned about the mistreatment of Maoris while overlooking the abuse of Indigenous peoples in Canada. So there's this odd reference to Indigenous peoples elsewhere in the British Empire and not discussion, the sort of uh, negligence about the existence of Indigenous people living in the same space as these Franco-Ontarians. Belcourt took aim at these special rights of Francophones in relation to Germans, and there's again, there's a reference to Germans as an important part of understanding how this bilingual, what became a single, a solely bilingual system with English and French, uh, and how German actually played an important role in, in the making of that uh, in the early 20th century. So in Belcourt's view, he wrote, and I quote, he argued to the Supreme Court of Ontario, the natural right of French speaking subjects of His Majesty in Canada in the matter of language is entirely different from the rights of Germans and all others. Despite his previous assertion about the rights of all to speak their mother tongue, he argued that he argued that, and I quote, "The Germans and other people who have immigrated or will later come to Canada to reside, they have no such right. 
On the contrary, it is manifest that by coming voluntarily to settle and live in Canada, they abandoned, renounced, and waived their natural right to speak their native language. In a call to arms to recent policy changes, the Association Canadienne Française d'Education, the French Canadian Education Association, took a similar tack. Its leaders argued that we do not claim it, the right to teach our mother tongue, as a privilege, as would be the case with German Canadians, but emphatically hold that we have the right to this tuition, even if Ontario were, as is wrongly, as is wrongly claimed by some, an exclusively English province. The association's leader, leaders added, and I quote, to assimilate the status of the French and German languages in Ontario is not justified by the constitution. Both Belcourt and the French Canadian Association of Education spoke of natural rights, but neither believed that that legal concept was universally applicable. To save French and Ontario schools, Francophones distinguished themselves from German speakers. The triad of English, French, and German as possible languages of instruction had already disappeared, and it was in Francophones' interest to stake out a new position in the face of Anglophone nationalism. So to conclude, French was not the only language on the minds of Anglophone elites in the late 19th and early 20th century in Ontario and elsewhere in Canada. The presence of other linguistic groups in Ontario also shaped ideas, discourse, and politics about the nation and citizenship. Although German speakers were not passive subjects, state bureaucrats and Anglophone politicians were active promoters of the English language. Many German speakers did not push back to anywhere near the same extent as many Francophones did in the same period. From the moment that German was no longer used as a language of instruction, there were no German schools in Ontario. While legislatively possible until 1912 and talked about in 1912, provincial requirements about English, authorized textbooks, individual school boards, and even German-speaking parents and trustees turned them into English schools with a certain bilingual focus by the 1890s. Starting in 1885, provincial regulations required German to be taught in all, or required that English to be taught in all schools. And after 1890, German could be taught in addition to the dominant language in the province, as articulated by this emergent new uh, linguistic ideology. And finally, both local control and central authority coexisted in controlled separate spheres. And it's that the variation how state authority existed um, as we enter into this period in the 1880s, that is what in many ways led to this outcome in which central authority got to win out against local variation. Through a series of cultural policies, the education department ensured that schooling in Ontario undermined multilingualism and the German language in particular, more than it promoted a balanced bilingualism amongst the children of German speakers. For them, their experience was largely an English one. So with that, I thank you for your attention and look forward to questions and comments and the discussion. Great, thank you so much, Ben. And um, I invite uh, participants who have questions to go ahead and put them in the Q&A and I'll be curating them. Um, I've got a couple of questions though before myself, uh, before we uh, turn to our listeners today. Um, great presentation, Ben, very, very interesting. And um, one question, in the United States, um, of an important uh, kind of standard bearer for the German language and education were in fact parochial schools. Um, so would fall into the category of special schools in Canada. Um, to what extent, say for example, I mean, and there's a there's a historically the 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 Lutherans were were more uh, consistently pro-German than say Catholics, in part because of the strong connection with Lutherans to either German ethnicity or or some kind of ethnicity, right? Norwegian, Swedish, and so forth, as opposed to the Catholic Church, which was, it, you know, could have been, say, a mix of, you know, Germans and Irish in one particular area, or it could have been Germans and Poles or Italians and Irish, so forth. Um, to what extent was there space already in that second half of the 19th century for, say, German Lutherans to have special schools? And was were they perhaps a little bit more kind of aggressive or uh, steadfast in terms of their support for the German language? The, thank you, that's a, a, a great question. Um, I'm gonna speak around it a bit um, to sort of, I think part of the answer here is the nature of state structures and power existed. Um, in this case, there's quite a lot of variation. So there's, there's not parochial schools, 
uh, Lutherans, while well, the, slightly the biggest group of uh, German speakers in, in Ontario in this time period, um, are not actually behaving in ways similar to the United States. And, uh, and one explanation I think I would have is because there's not a structure into which they can feed, then they're not, they don't have a sort of an institutional uh, ability to then sort of create this space or sort of then express some ideas and, and carry out some of the, implement some of those ideas. So there, there, there are things, these are all called separate schools and there could be Lutheran separate schools, but these are almost non-existent. Like there'll be like two Lutheran separate school boards in all of on, Ontario because there's no reason to create it. So separate also sort of means the smaller group in relation to the rest of it. So in the, you take a city uh, in, or a town in, in uh, southern Ontario, the dominant group is Protestant and the majority of them are German speaking Protestant. They instead just form the public school board or they become the trustees on a public school board. So instead they're using the main public school board as the tool to um, sort of foster German language education. There's a very generous state structure from 1851 until the 1890s that's allowing public schools to just use where the German language prevails to, to be used um, uh, um, as a vehicle for promoting the German language. Uh, and if there's an, uh, an English minority, 35% of trustees, there's still sort of an equilibrium and allowing for these two things. And, and so th that's all within the public school system as th through elected school trustees. And then at the same time, in those same places where there's a public school system, there's a Catholic school system. And in many of these places, the the vast majority of the Catholics are German speaking rather than than French speaking. So depending where in southern Ontario they find themselves. So as the the foundations of German Protestant gets weakened by around 1900, um, and German Protestants all of a sudden start becoming minorities on, uh, minorities as the trustees on school boards, school boards, English school or public school boards increasingly just become English school boards, and it's actually then the Catholic school boards or these Catholic separate schools that become a stronghold's too, long, too strong of a word. But by about 1910, Catholic, Catholic separate schools are doing more to promote the German language than public school boards because they continue to be the ethnic majority trustees on these Catholic school boards. Uh, and so sort of the system that got created with uh, and how religion and, and language and sort of create different geographies in different places that over time is actually Catholic separate schools that become um, the German language lasts longer. And so even until, whereas local school boards, there's not a, a, a decree by the provincial government and so Canada joins World War I in 1914, there's no decree to ban the German language as a subject ever, or not until you know October, 1918. But in 1914 or 1915, a local school board could decide uh, to just stop teaching the German language. And so you look at say the town of Berlin, Ontario, so one of the bigger German speaking towns, uh, the public school board stops teaching German in 1915, the Catholic school board doesn't stop teaching German until 1918. So just an example of, of uh, anyway, so I'm sort of speaking around your question, uh, and, but nothing, but what, and only to conclude, so I've, I, written, I wrote this other book about uh, German speakers in Argentina. Uh, and in that case, German Lutherans are clearly sort of fit, fitting this model that you're describing. So German Lutherans are more interested in fostering Germanness and they have more connections to the German state. The German state in South America has this interest in fostering uh, sort of ties between German minorities and and in the, in the German Empire in this pre-1914 world. And in that case, the relationship is all German Lutheran and, and German Empire and German Catholics are sort of this uh, other group that sort of stays a bit more separate and integrated more into Argentine ecclesiastical structures. So uh, I've in, in engaging these two projects, I was very much looking for the role of German Lutherans, German Lutherans in German nationalism and uh, or, in, or, or German thinking, um, but uh, it was not to be found. Very interesting. It would be interesting also to kind of look at, for example, and I'm sure there are records of this, um, say individual congregational histories to see at what to what extent they switch to using English as the dominant language of the services or more English services than German services, which would be an indication that they're that the religious instruction, specifically religious instruction like catechism or confirmation would be then also switched from German into English because, um, you know, that's one thing that, you know, it's sort of the, the kind of diehard argument that probably you saw in Argentina as well is that sort of one's children's spiritual health is dependent on the knowledge of German, the German language so they can access scripture through Luther's translation of the Bible. And that, you know, the sort of fundamental confessional documents of uh, you know, the Lutheranism, you know, being in German, just, you know, it's, it's for a lot of folks, just not acceptable, um, being in English. So just to sort of see to what extent there may have been 
whether the, the, the Lutheran congregations were sort of in sync with what was going on in, in, in the public schools in the same area, or maybe lagging a little bit more. I'm guessing that probably there was a lag that they were, you know, holding on in terms of, you know, German language services probably extending after World War One, even. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes. So uh, the, the the my my book that's coming out is about basically two things: education and religion, uh, and everything you just said. Uh, uh, square. So just to, to add to this, so German Lutheran churches so in the same town where the Catholic school board is teaching German until 1918 and the public school board is teaching German until 1915 as a subject of instruction. That same town that Catholic churches stopped, had, had limited or even stopped using um, German in uh, religious practice and Catholic practices um, by about 1905 or 1910, depending on what Lutheran congregation, um, there's sort of more than one Lutheran church, so there's some variation. Um, but those churches are using German throughout the war and, and into the 1920s. And in, in, a, in a few select congregations, the German language, I don't know if I should say alive and well, but is doing pretty okay in 1930, when the, the end of my study. So there's a, a, clear, um, a clear relationship, at, exactly as you described, about the language and Lutheranism in a way that the Catholics don't have. But then if you take that to the school question and sort of the nature of bureaucracy, the inverse is almost found. I think that was, I'll circle back to this initial point about just the structures of power and how uh, elected officials and, 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 and autonomy work that sort of inverts the, um, the relationship. Interesting. And again, if uh, folks have questions that they want to pose, feel free to enter them into the chat. I'm gonna, since I've got the floor here and we don't have any other questions yet, I've got a whole bunch of notes that I'm, I was writing down furiously here. Now, this may be something that it's a, it's a little bit farther afield and you may not be familiar with it, but I'll just kind of throw that out there. Um, in further west of Ontario, so like in the Prairie Provinces, where there were larger numbers of Russian German Mennonites that settled, German speaking Mennonites, mm -hmm. it was in the 1920s where they really, you know, there was a major exodus down to Mexico first and then eventually farther down into to Latin America, but especially to Mexico, it's like 1925, somewhere around there, specifically over the issue of education, um, where they basically, because they, to this day, maintain German not only as a, as a, as a, as a language of instruction in the most traditional uh, schools, like in, in northern Mexico and Bolivia and Paraguay and so forth. To what extent were other provinces kind of patterning like Ontario, or was there, you know, the farther west you get, or at least not as far as say British Columbia or something, but places like the Prairie Provinces, was there more zeal or less zeal to Anglify the population? There, the, this is a very um, similar story. Uh, and then in, in all these cases, then the, the place of French speakers comes up as this sort of flashpoint. And also then in terms of memory or historiography becomes like the, the dominant focus and everything else is sort of uh, left aside. Um, and so it may be, Thinking historiographically, one point of talking about Germans alongside French in Ontario in this time period is because of that sort of uh, uh, errors, maybe not the right word, but sort of a, a preference to always just sort of think of national history in national terms and not think of uh, ethnic diversity as part of national history. Um, but yeah, so the government of Manitoba, um, so Manitoba is a site of slightly earlier settlement than Saskatchewan, so Manitoba sort of happens first, uh, but there's a very similar story. Of uh, taking place of, of so in the case of Manitoba there's sort of, there's more uh, so in Ontario from this moment of founding there's three languages French German and, and English in the case of Manitoba uh, there's a space for German but then also uh, Ukrainian and Polish also have a sort of autonomy that is also stamped out uh, by about 1910 um, and in in all these cases I, I think you can see examples of the Anglophone majority uh, embracing this idea of monolingualism and pushing um, pushing, so first incrementally pushing for space for English in these autonomous school systems or you know, boards or however they're autonomous. Uh, and then f French being the most successful in resisting, getting, in, they get, they're more successful in all sorts of ways. They have a major French speaking uh, population really nearby. They can get tra teachers trained in Quebec in ways you can't get teachers trained in Poland to then just constantly coming to, to uh, the Canadian prairies. So they have this sort of geographic benefit this sort of uh, hub nearby that's giving francophones a different advantage plus they make these arguments about these special rights uh, founding peoples uh, that not only they make an argument that they believe firmly in ang the anglophones also buy the argument more they're more willing to accept the this duality than they are so that there's an ongoing push um against german and, and ukrainian schools in the Canadian prairies in ways that french sort of manage to survive 
manages to survive far more than the other others. Interesting. Well, okay, we've got, um, here's a question from Jeanette Bragger. Um, what is known about the children who went through these systems? Did they speak German at home while having to use English in schools? It's not clear to me how the children were affected by the official policies. Did heritage speakers lose their language very quickly? Okay, so what what is known? So it's uh, if if th speaking about a, a thirty five year period, um, there's a lot. I would say there's a lot of variation. So I'll, just, I'll speak hesitantly about um, what what's going on. So what what you I would say so. Another part of my book is about um, two high school colleges. So sort of in, they're in between a high school and a, a university. They eventually get, they're, they're colleges that, that you go to right after elementary school. So that's sort of a, a weird uh, early 19th century or early 20th century educational system. Uh, and so if thinking of these places as the product of, or the people who go to them are the product of, of this elementary school system, uh, there is, I have a whole thing about language loss in my um, in my book. So there, there is definitely uh, um, German becomes uh, uh, a mother tongue that is also not the dominant language of people in all sorts of ways. So they are, if you think of language abilities and and uh, and and education in sort of a broader sense, they have like their 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 business German is not as good as their church German. Uh, their their family German is better than their. Um, um, uh, better than other kinds of Germans that they can speak, right? So this is, uh, and this is an example of this, the school system has eroded or prevented the creation of a more balanced bilingualism by, by pushing a sort of formal education, a written education um, uh, in English. But that said, in some form, some aspects of life, of life in a diglossic situation, the German language was doing okay, uh, maybe not for every single person who's, so if you got 200,000 people who, according to a census, are German, you do not have 200,000 people in Ontario who can sort of converse at least at home in German the same way they can in English. So there's an element of language loss or linguistic assimilation going on, but there's a very significant part of this sort of 200,000 people who are of German heritage who have an ongoing ability in German. Uh, there's a, 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 a dialectical German being spoken. There's, I'm not an expert in dialects, but there's evidence of, of writing, they're quoting how in German, uh, there's this German newspaper that I've read a lot of uh, that complains about the people can't read the newspaper, but they can talk German and they, then they write in sort of a very, uh, a modified Pennsylvania German. Um, ich kann dat Deutsch, Deutsch sprach net lesen, things like that. So that's sort of my understanding of how that, that's a, a quote that I have in my book about us. Um, uh, so there is definitely a dialect going on um, that's, so there's, that's, I think that's, that's not evidence of assimilation, that's, but that is evidence that a school system lost a balanced bilingualism. So to maybe sort of shift the conversation, it's not, was it lost, was there assimilation, but there is not, there's a missed opportunity for balanced bilingualism by 1910 um, that has emerged that in 1880 was, a, was doing a lot better. So the school system, the public school system or the, uh, uh, this, this Catholic college, for example, is doing a lot more to foster an equality of the two languages in all aspects of life in, in 1880 than they are in 1910, let alone 1925, where it's increasingly limited to uh, training pastors in, the, in a Lutheran college and, and things like that. Interesting. Got two more questions here. This one's coming from John Baltz, who's a uh, doctoral student in, in uh, history here at UW-Madison. John writes, the French critique of German speakers' light rights or lack of rights to continue learning their language because of their relation or connection to Canadian history was quite interesting. Did any German speakers weigh in on this debate in media publications, if not in the Supreme Court itself? That, that I know of, no. Um, so this was um, in this moment of 1912, um, this this was a clear um, this was a clear English French debate, and I have no evidence of I, I found nothing um, uh, about how how German speakers are talking about the the, the conflict over Regulation 17. So Regulation 17 has a conflict goes from kind of 1910 1912 until 1927. So especially after about 1914, I would be even less likely to suspect there would be a public intervention about German rights in, in anything. It was sort of more of a sort of hold on for. Uh, in the context of World War One, um, but anyway, so no, so I don't have any uh, evidence uh, or any examples of how German speakers also participated in the debate, but rather they were only the objects or, or uh, um, 
a foil uh, uh, that they were speaking about uh, by 1912. And um, and so I, when I, so in my original dissertation, that the, the French part was not, I didn't have developed. That was a, a, post, a, a book research part. And I found that really fascinating as well. I really think how German resurfaced at a, as afterlife, uh, the memory of German education in Ontario in 1912 and in a sort of uh, national debate or Ontario national debate um, to be really quite uh, intriguing. And I, so I wouldn't rule out that you could find some voices uh, and, uh, if, you know, it could be the topic of a master's thesis or something, how Germans also participated in, in Regulation 17 debates. But from everything I've seen and everywhere I've looked, uh, I have not found anything. And there wasn't, there weren't newspaper articles talking about Regulation 17 in Ontario German language newspapers in 1912 or 1913. It'd be interesting also to explore whether there was a difference between, say, the old stock, let's say, Pennsylvania German uh, settlers who started coming up to Ontario and the or upper Canada at that point in the 1780s, right, as loyalists, versus those, you know, German, German Canadians whose ancestors came later 19th century, or maybe even the second half of the 19th century, because here in the US, there's a very clear kind of cultural divide where basically those that came in the colonial era, um, German speakers basically saw themselves as, you know, fundamentally old stock colonial Americans, and different from these European Germans, right, whether there was a similar kind of whether the whether potentially the descendants of these old stock you know migrants from Pennsylvania um, may have viewed themselves differently and made different arguments as far as this you know kind of aligning themselves a little bit more with with say uh, French and, and and English speakers as far as like asserting a right for you know identity and and certainly including the language in Canada interesting. Okay, we've got um, another question here um, from Antje. Um, in some German American schools, including public schools with many German families in the mid 19th century, the curriculum was also different from standard American schools with a focus on physical education, music, inquiry, which was uh, included natural science. Was that also the case in German Ontario schools? So, kind of, were there any kind of curricular differences? So from the kinds of documents I've seen, uh, I don't have any, so I, I, I have a yes to this question, but I'm gonna start with my no. I don't have any real examples of this. So uh, in, um, in this uh, 1870s, 1880s moments, there, there must be because, so thinking about um, uh, the, you, I, it's fragmentary, right? How, you, how you're studying this 19th century world, but say the books that were being used in 1880 before there was a crackdown on the kinds of books to be used, uh, and then the contents of those books would suggest a different, uh, the only one that's coming to mind is a very bad example because it was about, it was a list of the French books that got targeted as well um, in these standardization policies and things about like, there was this one book that really struck me, it's really interesting, it was all about sort of Europe, it was a French, from France, the book, and it was all about European modernity uh, and all the, the mod modern inventions of the world. So they're learning about modern inventions as sort of imagined uh, in Paris. Um, and so you could take that further that then kids are learning different things. Um, so I, I don't, that's not a concrete answer, but I would think that simply uh, because they were looking for materials in German instead of in English, that would have led to some variation in, in some form, although I don't really know how it gets any real nuance or how it get, get at that very well. Um, one thing to add is that this entire textbook market uh, for German Ontario, to use a, a term, um, is the United States. So these major hubs in the United States, the major German speaking centers in the United States are influencing German speakers in Ontario. And that's also their religious structures are really integrated. So this is sort of like another uh, American, it sounds very un-Canadian of me to say, it's sort of another part of, of German America. And that's on, on one level, there's this integration, there's these all this variation like that I think I've described today, but there's also this integration. And so I think therefore, if they're getting books from Cincinnati or New York or Pittsburgh and things like that, or St. Louis, um, the things that are being produced by German Americans are going to be different than things being produced um, uh, for Anglophones in Ontario. You know, Brit the amount of British Empire stuff that a child in 1880 is learning in, in English Canada is going to be a lot more than what a kid would be learning based on the books and things that they're getting. But that's sort of a bit speculation. The one thing I'd add, though, so there's these, in addition to this entire public school system, which allows for German, and there's a significant German space until the 1880s or 1890s there's these two colleges which i've referenced already one and the catholic one's older so catholic ones from the 1860s and it emerges and there they're following a, a more classical model and so if the high school experience for a, a small minority of children who go to high school 
Uh, many kids, including of German families, are going to public high schools and they're following them. Uh, there's no German system in, in there's no main, there's no high schools in Germany. It's only an elementary uh, accommodation. But for those who would go to a classical school, a classical college, the St. Jerome's College in particular, so it's a very small number of people. We're talking, you know, 100, 130 students at a time out of a, you know, a massive province. They're learning, you know, they're getting more classical education, more religion in uh, in that education. Uh, things like Latin and Greek and rhetoric and, and just those kinds of subjects become a thing. But again, that's just a minority experience. Um, and then uh, another short question here what is the role of german in ontario today and knowing that that's not necessarily your area of research but but she's curious if you can speak to that. um that that's a, a good question uh and uh i i used to be a happy ontarian I'm, these things are not uh, front and center anymore uh, in that i'm in british columbia um so there was ongoing waves of german-speaking migration in ontario um you know from the as i described 1780s onwards. So there's a significant uh, influx of displaced persons in the 19, late 1940s and 1950s in Ontario. Uh, most German immigration to Ontario sort of stops by the 1960s or 1970s um, in, in ways that might sound familiar to Wisconsin. I'm not sure of the, the variation here. Um, so there's definitely um, a place for Germans still in, in, in today's Ontario or in say the 1990s Ontario. So there's uh, still a German language Lutheran churches uh, scattering the landscape of the province now, I can name four of them. I don't know if there are. Um, I don't know. If, I don't know if there are four of them or if there are twenty-five of them. Uh, they're with so they're still within the structures that German Lutherans had built uh, in the early twentieth century. The congregations just over and increasingly just became English-speaking, and a few of them remained uh, bilingual. And some new ones were founded in the post-war post World War II era. So there's a, a, a definite space for German language religion, or a, a small space for German language religion. Um, but in many ways, you know, it, it's shifted. There's, you can see the legacies of, of German in Ontario, probably in ways, you, I think in ways you can see in Wisconsin as well. So German as a department at the University of Toronto is a much bigger department than um, uh, you know, at uh, McMaster University in Hamilton or something, right? So certain places, there's these legacies, these institutional legacies um, that were created in, in another era that still have these remnants today that you still see examples of uh, um, there, there is a place, but it's it's much reduced in in today's uh, Toronto or today, today's Ontario is definitely um, uh, got other linguistic configurations which involve uh, non-European peoples as a really important part of uh, sort of the multicultural makeup of Ontario. So German is a very small part of a much more diverse city and, and province than than in the 1960s. And here's a methodological question coming from Maxwell Greenberg: How relevant are census records that report on language? or language use for making causal claims about the impact of language policy? Oh, with sen I, oh I have so much to say about the census. The census is not uh, critically analyzed enough. I don't, uh, in, as it pertains to German, German speakers in Canada, um, there's this great book about 19th century language politics in Canada um, by Bruce Curtis, in case you're interested in this kind of topic. It, either my census category, I didn't get into this at all, uh, puts English, Scottish, and Irish as a single group um, rather than, than splitting them into three groups. And that's a sort of a Canadian 1851 census decision about the relative weight of British vis-a-vis -vis French. So for example, there's already a category that's a bit, not, not irrelevant, but a little bit constructed, right? That all these British subjects are being lumped together that rather than split apart. Um, I, I hope I'm not making any causal claims whatsoever about um, uh, the data from the census and um, uh, sort of linguistic ability or community formation. Uh, it was just sort of a, my only intent there was to show that if someone's got an ethnic origin, uh, you know, these are sort of the makeup, it's about 10% of the province, which explains why German has the special rights in, in, in the school system. Um, but one thing to just to add to that, the, the first, like the introduction to every Canadian census, I, I kind of want to write a sort of Pan-American story of uh, census categories. Um, but in the Canadian census from 1881 to 1931, no one seems to have paid attention to, or no one's written an article about it. They tell, they tell the census, the, the, they give the methodology to the census taker, how you describe someone as German, Scottish, Irish, whatever. So this is how you, and they lay it out and they say some really remarkable things. So it's all... Uh, patrilineal according to the census so er, the numbers that I'm presenting are, are totally false so if a man is third generation German American Canadian so they you know Pennsylvania German comes to Canada and marries an English woman immigrant that per, the child is German according to the Canadian census uh, so and, and they say this is the methodology that it's entirely gendered 
Uh, and then there's a different methodology. Well, it's sort of it, gender doesn't matter in uh, non-white groups. Uh, so they also explain that very clearly that they have this uh, patrilineal system of, of 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 ethnic origin of race. Um, that anyway, so um, it's a really questionable uh, number. Although if, you know, it might average out that uh, in gender balances, that might average out to you get the same outcome. But the way the outcomes, the way someone's defined as a German or a Scot or, or, or an English person is, in, is uh, methodologically very problematic. Um, and then the, the other thing is that the um, census is using like, these categories of, uh, uh, there's a couple different terms being used in different parts of the census, but they're describing origin rather than linguistic ability. And so if you take this one step further and look at communities, the communities I'm describing uh, in a given locality, you know, take a town and there's sort of 500 active members or, or um, uh, you know, depending on the size of your town, that doesn't really correspond to the number of people according to a census who lived in that town with who were classified as either German or or British or or whatever, right? So there's a huge discrepancy, and then thinking more broadly about migration studies, uh, there's uh, often a, 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 a an erroneous merging, right? Of you got the big number from a uh, from a census, and then the small number from an active community, and you're not paying attention to all these other people who actually are ethnic but don't participate in the community, and their disdain for the community is actually something that we should pay more attention to. Their their disinterest, their 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 their, uh, their isolation from the community is a study of ethnicity as well, right? And so we, we it's helpful to look at not just this ethnic core, but also this this broader sort of ethnicity and how it exists. You know, name your group and name your time period, but it's something that's uh, in a in, in earlier studies was totally just merged together, and uh, we should pay a lot more attention to. Well, great, wonderful. Uh, thanks everybody for the for the questions. Thanks, Ben, so much for your presentation and for the excellent discussion here. Um, and uh, hopefully, we can welcome you in person sometime to Madison, Wisconsin. It's great to see you. Thanks everyone for coming, and thanks for having me only virtually. Uh, I hope I'll see you sometime in person. We would love to have you here. All right. Goodbye. Bye bye. Take care.